Well, over, over lunch, I was reminded of a story that I thought was a good illustration for the need for consultant checking translation. How many of you know what inclusive and exclusive pronouns are? Yeah? Somebody explain it. Zach, why don't you explain it for us? Like with the word, with we. There would be, some languages would have uh, a we that includes, uh, includes a speaker uh, or, and, and also a, a word for we that, that does not include the speaker but includes the rest of the group. Yeah, that would, so uh, it, there would be a form of we where I say we and I mean all of you too, the people that I'm addressing. And then there's another form of we where I mean we but not you. You see the difference? Like, we are going to Papua New Guinea next month. Who, who, am I including you in the we? No, that's a we exclusive. If I say we are going to sit around the campfire tonight, does that include you? So that's we inclusive. You can see the difference? When I say we are going to Papua New Guinea, I'm talking about me and my family, but I'm not talking about you. So some languages have different words for we in those situations. The, translation, the language I work with, Anga, does not, thankfully. Um, but Tok Pisin, which is the trade language, does di differentiate that. You'll be able to understand it. For we inclusive, they say you, me. You, me. We inclusive, you, me. For we exclusive, they say me, Pella. Me, Pella. So me, Pella, but not you, Pella. Me, Pella. So I have a good friend. His name is Stephen Thomas. He is an Anga speaker. He grew up in a time when, in the Enga province, the only languages they learned were their native language of Enga, and they learned English in the schools. They didn't learn any Tok Pisin, which is the national language. So time goes by, and he becomes the director for the Papua New Guinea Bible Translation Association. This is in the 1980s. And there's a New Testament dedication in the island region where they heavily use Tok Pisin that he never learned growing up. He only learned as an adult. So they go to the island area, and they're getting ready for a New Testament dedication, and they need to go wash up in the river. And so he's there with a delegation, but he's the director, so they sort of put him in charge to find them a place to go where they can go wash. You know, there's no showers or anything. They've got to go to the river. So they go to the river, and Stephen sees a woman in the river washing her clothes, very common. And so he wants to ask her, is it okay if we go up the river and wash? And he says... Remember, he doesn't know talk Pizen very well. So he says, Enup, you, me, go on top, lick, lick, na was, was. Is it okay if we, inclusive, go, we, including you, go up the river a little bit and wash together? And you can imagine the reaction uh, that he got from that. And I think he, he quickly realized from the look on the woman's face that he had used the wrong word. And I think quickly clarified. Remember, he's representing the Bible translation organization, and he's asking this woman if they will go wash, if they can wash together up the river. So it's those sorts of errors that we are hoping to correct in a consultant check and catch. A lot of these things you don't catch in normal uh, processes, but a consultant check can be a great time to check, for, to catch those sorts of errors. So we're going to talk a little bit about the road to get to a consultant check. Um, there's a number of steps that need to happen first. We'll go over, over them quickly here, and then we'll take a little more time with some of them. The first step is drafting. That's where you have nothing translated and you come up with a first draft, much like all of you did this morning with the Lord's Prayer. That's the drafting phase. Okay, you also have um, basic computer checks. Paratext is a great tool, it has all these checks to help you find errors like you know, you started a quotation but with quotation marks, but you never ended it. It catches those sorts of things. So it's almost impossible to catch with the human eye. So basic checks are done actually throughout the process multiple times. You have an advisor, what I call an advisor check. This is where the team, just like you did, completes their draft of the translation, and you have the advisor or the facilitator um, review it, particularly against uh, the Greek, if possible, or the Hebrew. Um, or in some cases, I guess, the Aramaic. Um, and you're reviewing it. You're checking it for uh, consistency. You're checking to make sure that it's consistent with the underlying source language of Greek or Hebrew. And then you're making notes for your team. 
Then we have what we like to call the naturalness check. Um, this is where you're reading the translation out loud together as a team to make sure that it sounds good when you read it and nothing sounds awkward. A lot of that is difficult to catch when you're just working on paper or working on a computer. And then when you hear it out loud, think, oh, that doesn't sound right. That's not how we speak. That's awkward. It's only when you hear it out loud that you can catch some of those things. So we read through the whole translation um, of a particular book doing the natural. Then there's something called the community check or village check. And I'll be honest, opinions are divided on the effectiveness of this. The idea is that you take your translation and go into a village setting with people who have not been involved, read the translation and see if they understand it or not. We don't really do this, to be honest. Um, some translators do, some don't. And it might vary from context to context. I'm not sure what ABT is uh, recommending on that. Um, you'll probably cross that bridge when you get to it. There's some, I see some problems with this. One is the idea that it's not always a good thing to have too many cooks in the kitchen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That if you have too many people speaking into a translation, it can really slow things down and uh, it can get you off on some rabbit trails. That's one of the problems. The second problem, and I think Aaron and I were talking about this over lunch, um, uh, Eugene, is it Nida or Nita? I can never remember. Not Nida. Nida. The idea that a translation should be perfectly understandable the first time you read through it. And I think that's an unrealistic expectation and maybe even an unhealthy expectation. Because how many of us understood every word of scripture the first time we read through it? How many of you understand every word of scripture now? No hands are going up. Scripture takes time. And I think that's okay. I don't think we need to be able to understand every detail perfectly the first time we read through. Now, when you do a village check, you're going to be tempted to say, you know what, they didn't quite get it. Uh, the translation must be wrong. That, that may be the fact, but it may also not be the fact. It may just be that the concept is translated perfectly well, but it's a difficult concept, and it takes time for people to understand it, and it takes teaching. Um, so I'm... <sighs> I'm sort of ambivalent on the, cons on the community or the village check. Uh, I think it makes more sense, we have a team of six translators, so we already have a good number of people speaking into the translation and can sort of catch things. Now if you're working with one person or two people, it might make more sense to do, bring more people into that uh, checking process because you don't want just the opinion of one person guiding the translation. So I'd say if the number of translators that are working on it is a small number, one or two. Village check probably makes more sense. What we do instead is we've done some recording of scripture and we've distributed that in villages. And it's sort of more of an informal process where if they don't like something, they'll come and tell us. And um, it's interesting, the feedback we've gotten has mainly been on things I would never would have expected. Like, we don't like how you're spelling the name Mary. You're saying Maria and we wanted to say Mary. Okay, I mean, that's not what I was expecting, but that was one of the main uh, points of feedback that we got. Um, so village check could be beneficial, uh, could cause some problems. The other problem with village check, and this will be cultural depending on where you are, in Papua New Guinea, when you ask people a question, they want to tell you what, you what they think you want to hear. And so you may not get very accurate information um, you also have a problem of uh, people being afraid of exposing their ignorance. So they may pretend to understand something that they really don't. Um, asking questions can be a difficult thing in various cultures. Some cultures asking questions can be a sort of an aggressive thing, perceived as an aggressive thing. Um, so it's, it's, you're really going to have to evaluate that by context in your specific situation of whether or not a community or village check is going to be a valuable process or not. I found that we can accomplish most of what we would try to accomplish in village check through the consultant check. And so we generally have not done it. All right, then we have the process of back translation. Now, when I first started, I did back translation here with the advisor check. And I found over time that so much was changing as a result of the advisor check 
that I was kind of having to redo the back translation. And so I said, uh, I'm sorry, I was about to use a talk as an word, Mosky. Uh, Mosky means forget it, forget it. I'm just going to separate the two. I'm going to do the advisor check first, the naturalness check, get the translation to the point where we feel really confident about it, then I'll do the back translation. And so I separated that out, and that was a good decision. Uh, we'll talk a bit more uh, about back translation uh, as we go. But inevitably, as you do back translation, you'll have more, you'll catch more things that you want to edit in your translation. By the way, anybody who wants these slides, I'm happy to share them with you uh, if you'd like them. Well, I'm the advisor. So it just changes the words. Right. So, um, yeah, this is assuming that you have, uh, and I don't, again, I don't know how things are going to be structured exactly. If you're a facilitator, you're, you're New Testament translator, uh, this would, uh, I would picture people like Zach and David doing this work, the advisor check. So advisor is different than consultant. Let me make that clear. Uh, so the advisor is the, usually an expat working with the project who knows the language. Um, hopefully the team themselves are doing the drafting because as an expat foreigner, you'll never speak the language as well as they will. And so as much as you can have the team themselves do the drafting, the better it'll be. Um, and then you come in as a facilitator or ad advisor and you review what they have come up with. And for me, uh, in the beginning stages, I sat with the team for the drafting until we got a good feel for what we were doing and got to a point where I thought, you know what, they can do the drafting on their own now, and I'll focus more on the advisor check. So thanks, Joel, I make, help make that clear. Is that, is that clear? Any questions about that? Okay. okay, so after all of these steps, drafting, computer checks, advisor check, naturalness check, maybe a community or village check, back translation, then you're ready for a consultant check. So it really takes quite a few steps to prepare for the consultant check. Sure. So a back translation, thank you, I'm assuming a lot. Uh, back translation, when we translate the, the, for example, the Gospel of Matthew into Enga, in order to be approved to publish scripture, and just as a general good practice, we have to have our translation approved, reviewed, and approved by a trained consultant. Now this trained consultant generally does not speak the Enga language, or does not speak whatever language you're working in. Um, and so, in order for them to access your translation, you have to translate, um, I would take, for example, the Enga translation, and I translate it back into English in a very literal translation. So, as much as possible, the consultant can see what's happening in the Enga language. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions that I... Right, right. So the, when I put up the Enga version of the Lord's Prayer, that was the back translation, so that a consultant could review it and tell us if he was concerned about any of the translations choices that we had made. Yep. Yep. You're translating it into the target language, and then you're translating it back into, in our case, it would be English. Um, other cases, it might be Spanish. It would be a language, what they call a language of wider communication. So in South America, it would probably be Spanish. Uh, Brazil would probably be Portuguese. Um, in Iraq, I don't know what it would be. Maybe, uh, what do they speak? What's a language of wider communication? Arabic. Arabic. Okay. So um, that's what we're talking about. All right. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not uh, not necessarily sure how, how much you know about all of these things. So if anything's unclear, please don't hesitate to put your hand up and ask. All right, so let's look at, I thought it'd be good to actually go through the process of how some of this works. Because I think most of you, how many of you have actually worked in paratext? Okay, just a couple. So we're going to do some demonstrations in paratext so you can get a feel for the Bible translation software that you'll use. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that English is a uh, minority language that we're translating into. So you can get a feel for how this works. So here is the ABT translation. 
of Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to uh, 13, which is, you see is currently blank. Okay, on this side, we have a variety of translations, uh, English translations. Um, in Papua New Guinea, we work from English because the translators know enough English to work from it. Uh, we don't work from Greek when we're drafting because they don't speak Greek. They don't understand Greek. So whatever area you're translating in, you might be looking at Spanish translations. Uh, you might, again, Portuguese, Arabic. You might be working from some of those languages. It just depends on where you are in the world. We work from English. Other people in Papua New Guinea work from Tokpizan. So here's what we like to do. Um, we like to read first from a very literal translation. So this is a very literal translation uh, of Matthew. So it says, Thus, therefore, pray ye, our Father who art in the heavens, let thy name be sanctified. So you read from a very literal translation to get as close as possible to the Greek or Hebrew as you can. Then you read from a more of a middle translation like the NIV. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Okay, then you move to uh, more of a loose translation, like a New Living Translation. This is, this is what we do. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And then you can, like what we'll do after that is then we'll read in Tok Pizan as well. Or you could read from a very loose translation, like the translation for translators. So pray things like this. Father, you who are in heaven, we exclusive desire that you be honored, revered, or that people honor or revere you. So you read through scripture in, in a variety of translations so you can get a feel for different nuances. Um, and once you've done that, then you do your drafting into your target language. So having read through those, uh, let's hear, um, we'll just pull from the translations you did this morning. Give us your verse 9. Hopefully you have your work from this morning. Or if somebody else has verse 9 readily available. Okay, go ahead. Our Father who is up above, revered is your name. Our Father who is up above, revered is your name. Good. Oh, and this is a, this is a quotation, isn't it? I'm going to put quotation marks. Our Father who is up above, revered is your name. We could even say, we could even mark it as words of Jesus if we want. And then it comes up in nice red font. Our Father who is up above, revered is your name. Okay, good. You know, I'm going to get, these are um, poetic formatting. I'm going to get rid of those. Just to simplify things. All right. Now, at the end of the last session, we're talking about the importance of keeping key terms consistent. So down below, there's this great tool. It's called Biblical Terms Renderings, right here. And it has various key terms that we want to look at. So here, it says, agiazo, hallow, or regard as holy. And so what we do is we click on that box. And we write in what our key term is. So here we're saying revered. So as soon as I, now if you're doing it in a, another language, like if I was doing it in Enga, I would say speak well. And I'd put that in parentheses so that the consultant later on can see what our literal term is. But we're just doing it in English, so I'll keep it at revered. So as soon as I hit OK, then that box goes away because it's now recorded. And it says, oh, good, check. You've got that key term in. Next time uh, the word 
sanctified or hallowed or revered, next time that, that Greek word comes up, um, it'll remind you, hey, you haven't, if you use the same word, it'll automatically recognize it and say, okay, you've got it. If you've used a different word, it'll say, hey, this word doesn't match with the word you already used. And so you have a chance to basically teach the computer, teach the software what your key terms are, and it'll look for them. And once you put them in, it'll say, okay, you've got your key term covered here. So it's really, really great. So there's a few different um, settings here. You can have to do just main, like some of the main biblical terms, or you can have it do like all terms. I do all terms because it's a great check. Um, and so here it has name, which probably if you just chose limited number of terms, that wouldn't be there. But I think it's a great check. I would, have, I would definitely advise doing this from the get-go. I've waited too long, and it's a lot of work to get caught up. But if you do this from the get-go, it's really helpful. So for name, we're translating name. And for heaven, we're translating up above. And for pray, oh, I forgot that part. Oh, we'll just say pray. We forgot the first part. See, that helped me already. Showed me that I missed something. We forgot the first part of verse 9. It says, uh, hey, let's say, um, pray then like this. Okay, so once I save that, you'll see that the key term down here will disappear because it'll see that we're, we've got it. There, it's gone. So now it's like, okay, I see your key term is there. So you're all good. All right, let's go to verse 10. I'm just going to fill this in myself to speed things along. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Okay, and again, I would, I'm not going to do it now, but I would go in and fill in all the key terms um, so that I'm teaching the software what my key terms are for each of those things. In fact, I'll go ahead, it won't take long, I'll go ahead and do that. Computers are responding slowly. So kingdom, and earth. Okay, now what do you see here? It says uranos, heaven and sky. What have we said is our key term? Up above. Up above. We said for heaven we're translating as up above. But what did I do? Heaven. I did heaven. So it's saying, hey, your key term is off. Saying you're still missing your key term. So either, either I change heaven to up above, or I say, you know what? Heaven is also another key term I could use. So I'm going to put that down as another possibility. And it would go away. So it's catching any time that you change, that you're not following your own key terms, it catches it for you, which is really helpful. Okay. I don't think we should translate it two different ways in the same passage, so. I'm going to change it to up above. There. Now the key term is taken care of. Okay, give us today our needed bread. Uh, what should we say for that? Give us today our necessary food. Good. Okay, we actually don't have any, it's not recognizing any important key terms in that verse. The fairly basic vocabulary. Let me get rid of these. Okay, what about verse 12? What did we have for that? Give us, uh, release our debts as we release those who owe us. Okay. Release our debts as we release those who owe us. Okay, so for this Greek word, afiimi, afiimi, sorry, generally means forgive, but here we're saying it means release. 
putting that in as our key term. Okay. Ophilima, we're translating as debt. Um, you can actually, you can finagle it to put in suffix, suffixes so it recognizes suffixes in the language, but I'm not going to do that right now. So I'm just going to put debts just to make things run smoothly. Okay, and then we see ophiletis. So this is actually the same root word as that we just saw, but instead of saying debts, we're saying those who owe us. So. All right, and then the last, last verse, what do we have? Aaron, I know you guys worked on it. Everything is under your rule. Pray that in. You possess all life. All honor and praise belong to you without end. It is this world. So again, we same thing. We'd go through all of the key terms, we put those all in. Um, the only problem with this function is it's built for the critical text. Uh, it's not built for Byzantine text. So it's not too big of a deal, but it is a shortcoming. Does everybody know the difference when I say that? Critical text, Byzantine text, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. If at some point in the presentation of something else, you could wrap up with telling people why Matthew is on the table saying God and Robert out of the void, I would appreciate it. I'll answer that question for everybody. Okay, sure. I'll do that at the end. Remind me if I forget. Okay. So that's that's basically the drafting process. You're going through, you're looking at these various la language of wider communication translations, and then you're formulating it into the target language. So that's what we've just done. Okay, from there, we would go to, we could go to the advisor check. Now, as I could also, I told you about basic checks. There's a function here. Oh, the screen's not big enough, so never mind. Anyway, there's a function where you could go through and do the basic checks. And what it would do would say, it would catch this and say, hey, you started with a quotation mark, uh, but there's no quotation mark at the end. You need to put that in. So it'll catch that for you. Um, I'm not going to do it right now. It's a bit technical, but basically that capability is there. It'll find that. Uh, it also find if you, have a, if you have a period at the end of a sentence and the next sentence starts with a lowercase letter, it'll catch that, you know, things like that. Or if you start a paragraph with a lowercase letter, it'll catch that. There's really handy tools. All right, so now... We'll go to um, advisor check. And we'll just go through this quickly. So as an advisor, I'm then reading the Greek. Uh, we'll just do this with one verse. Utos un prosep kesteimis paterimon antisurinis agestito tonomasi. Okay, and then I'm focusing, let me make this a little smaller. So I read the Greek, and then I'm focusing mostly on very literal English translations. And I'm focusing on Byzantine English translations. Uh, Byzantine text. Um, so that's the Greek, and I'm comparing it to what I have back there that Joel mentioned. Thus, therefore, pray ye, our Father who art in the heavens, let thy name be sanctified. Another good one is I like is Young's literal translation, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, it's very literal, but it's good for this sort of checking. Thus, therefore, pray ye, our Father who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Um, there's another great Byzantine translation is the, the um, English New Testament according to Family 35. That should be available in Paratext in the next couple of weeks. Um, Therefore, you pray like this. Our Father who is in the heavens, let your name be reverenced. Uh, there's an English majority text version that's available in Paratext, also Byzantine. Um, so I'm, at this point, as the advisor or facilitator, I'm looking at the Greek and I'm looking at very literal translations and I'm comparing them to the uh, language that we're checking. And so I might do things like this. It says, pray then like this. 
Well, in Greek, there's this word here, and I realize this is technical, but this is technical work, so. Um, there's this word, imis, which is a, an emphatic pronoun. It's emphatic pronoun. So, the way more literal translation will do that, thus therefore pray ye, right? That's why King James always has those ye's in there. A lot of the time, it's, it's an emphatic pronoun in the Greek. Um, another translation does it by underlining it. Therefore, you pray like this. This is how the Gentiles pray, but you pray like this. So a lot of times that's missed in, in English. You don't catch that. And indeed, when you look at NIV, New Living, they, they drop it. But that doesn't mean that you should drop it in your language that you're working with, because your language may work very much similarly. They may have, you know, they may say the same way. You do this. And so I would ask the question. I'd make a comment here. Say, can we, can we make this emphatic? Oops. And say, you pray like this. So those are notes that I would make for my translation team that I work with, and uh, they'd respond, and we have good discussions. So I don't know if you all can see that or not. Okay. So anyway, um, we don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is the advisor check portion. Then we get into back translation. Sometimes it takes a while to load, so while it's loading, I'm going to go over back translation. So one of the questions that Aaron asked me about was, who should do the back translation? Should you as the facilitator do the back translation? Or should one of the translation team members do the back translation? Or so should somebody else in the community do the back translation? And I don't think there's a definite answer to that. I think it's going to vary from context to context. But I will give you some pros and cons of either way. So the advantages of the advisor or the facilitator, or the expat doing the translation, are, there's a lot of pros to that. One is you can learn the language. There's, doing back translation has helped me to learn Enga more than almost anything else because I really have to wrestle with it to state it in English and so it forces me to figure out what it's saying. And that's a huge benefit for me as, uh, as an advisor, a facilitator. It just makes me more and more capable of helping the team in the future. I can find additional corrections as I do the back translation. Inevitably, as I'm back translating from Enga into English, I find things that I otherwise would not have found, problems, things that need to be corrected. Uh, generally, the facilitator is an expat who has linguistics training. And so they uh, have a much greater ability to understand grammatical points. Most people in minority languages around the world have never studied their own language. They know how to speak it, but they cannot dissect it. If you say, what is that suffix doing at the end there? I don't know, that's just what we say. They can't tell you what it does. Only somebody who's linguistically trained can really sort of parse the language and figure out what's actually happening. So there's a lot of benefit in a linguistically trained person doing the back translation. Um, for my case, I have a much greater understanding of the back translation language, which is English. So because I'm a native English speaker, I can really translate it, back translate it well into English in a way that I know the consultant will get a clear picture. Um, let me just say here, there's Papua New Guineans, Enga people that I work with who speak Enga really well, and they speak English pretty well too. But just being able to speak two languages well does not mean that you can back translate from one to the other. That's a separate skill. And so just because somebody speaks both languages well does not mean that they'll be able to back translate well. Um, and understand what's happening in the target language and make it clear to a consultant what's happening in the target language through their back translation. That's a very difficult skill and people who are not linguistically trained will struggle with that, even if they speak bo both languages well. Again, greater ability to do a highly literal back translation. That's related to the point I just mentioned. 
and it makes the back translation more accessible to the consultant. The consultant will be able to make better use of the back translation if somebody is doing it who's linguistically trained. And it avoids copying a language of wider communication Bible text. What consultants have found is that when uh, a lot of times when Papua New Guineans are doing their own back translations, the back translation looks remarkably similar to the NIV because the, they just don't know how to say what is going on in their language into another language, into English, and so they just copy the NIV and paste it. And that can happen. The advantages of a mother tongue speaker doing the back translation is they have a greater, greater knowledge of their own language than you do. They'll know nuances that you will miss. Um, and so that's, that's a benefit. They might have a better understanding of the back translation language. Where I work, we back translate into English, and I'm a native English speaker, so I'll always have a better understanding of English than they do. But if you're working somewhere where they speak Spanish, it's not your native language, it's not their native language, they might actually speak Spanish better than you do. And so maybe they'll be more equipped to do the back translation. Uh, having a native speaker do the back translation gives the consultant greater insight into the thought patterns of mother tongue speakers. They'll be able to see better how mother tongue speakers think. And it also gives you as the advisor or the facilitator greater insight into how mother tongue speakers understand their own language. When they start back translating things in a way that you didn't expect or surprised you, you realize, oh, I didn't quite understand what that term meant. Now I have a better understanding. And it avoids errors of misunderstanding the target language. As a, as a foreigner who didn't grow up speaking the language, you're inevitably going to make mistakes about what things mean. Um, but a native speaker will not make those mistakes. And so who should do the back translation? It's really going to depend on each context. And you have to weigh that out for yourselves. You may have to try it one way and try it another way and see which works best. There's pros and cons to both approaches. For us, it, it works far better if I do it. Um, the team members that I work with would really struggle to do it. So I'll leave that up to each one of you to decide. As far as best back translation best practices, it should be very literal, very literal back translation. It should not sound like, you know, s smooth, nice English. As, you know, when we read the Lord's Prayer back translated into Enga, it didn't sound very good. Like, this is not how we speak English. Uh, and that's, that's what should be expected. Very literal. That's one of the other problems, by the way, of having a, one of the mother tongue speakers do it, is you're giving them two different standards. For their own translation, you're saying it should be nice and smooth and uh, sound natural. But then you're saying for the back translation, it shouldn't be that way. It can be confusing and send mixed signals. All right, we put added words in brackets. We were having an interesting discussion at lunch that somebody was saying when they read the, King, the new King James and they see, or King James, and they see words in italics, they say, like, uh, what was it, merely, what was the word, merely uh, adorned? Well, let, don't let your adorning merely, uh, I can't remember the, mere, Merely be the so merely is in italics, and somebody said, "Well, what does that mean?" They said, "Well, that means it's it's emphasized. It's really important that we pay attention to that word." What it actually means is it's uh, it's added. It's not it's not in the Greek, and I think it's one of the reasons that the Sarah of Anabaptist uh, would uh, not want to use the New King James. Uh, so we put added words in brackets. So in Anga, I, often I say that it literally says that. So. That, so go to your house. But it's actually, in order to fill that out for the consultant, I have to say, that is the case, so go to your house. Um, so I, I indicate that that is the case is not in the Anga, but it's necessary for the English to read somewhat smoothly. OK, you spell borrowed terms and names as they are spelled in the target language. So then Angeles came and helped Jesus out. That tells the consultant that the word I'm using for angels is a borrowed term. So he sees the spelling and he says, okay, they've borrowed that term. And he sees how we're spelling Jesus. Um, so that's helpful for the consultant. Uh, use slashes when one, when one rendering is not sufficient. So when uh, Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, it says he took her by the hand. Well, in Anga, they don't understand body parts the same way do we do. This is all one body part, you know? They don't, see, they don't have arm and hand. This is all one word. 
And so to convey that to a consultant, I said, Jesus took her by the hand slash arm, because it's all one word. All right, indicate grammatical information in parentheses when necessary. So if you're saying, uh, as they would say in King James, ye, uh, if you don't want to back translate into King James, uh, you would say you and then put plural in parentheses to let the consultant know um, in a particular case if it's important for them to know that it's a plural as opposed to a singular. It's one of the shortcomings of English. We can't distinguish between you singular and you plural. Uh, you back translate section headings, footnotes, introductions, everything. Basically everything that's in your target language translation, you back translate. Make use of the interlinearizer. We'll look at that in a minute. Okay. So this is the interlinearizer. So as I'm doing back translation, I use this interlinearizer. Uh, let's see. Oops. All right. So this is the Engel language, and what the interlinearizer does is it allows me. Those of you who have studied Greek know about parsing. Uh, it allows you to parse each word, and to say, uh, for example, if uh, we parsed in English. If I said Adam's computer, we would parse Adam's by saying, okay, Adam is the main noun, and then the apostrophe S, that, that means possession. It means it belongs to him. So that's parsing. You're saying what each individual part of the word means. And so that's very helpful uh, for the consultant to be able to glance at. It's helpful uh, for you as you're doing back translation if you're doing it. So you have a very the interlinearizer, I'll just, for verse 9, I'll just give you an example. Uh, literally in Anga, it says, you, this saying, prayer, sense, huh. With reference to us, Father, sky upon, habitually stand that. With reference to you, name that, goodness doing, say, say, huh. Now, you can see why an interlinearizer is not enough for a consultant to check your translation, because it sounds like godly good. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and so you need to do a back translation. So you take that and you put it into somewhat understandable English. Pray saying this, our Father who stands on top of the sky, tell us to speak well of your name. Now if the uh, consultant reads your back translation and has more questions about what the actual Anga is saying, then they can go to the interlinearizer and say, um, okay, what it actually says is, sky upon habitually stand that. All right, so they can investigate further. It gives them a tool to really dissect your language. But it's not enough for them to understand what you're saying. <laughs> so bo using both of them together is really beneficial. Then as you're doing your back translation, you have these great little boxes, these check boxes. As you do a verse, uh, you check it and you say that verse is finished. Then if you happen to go back and change the translation, if I were to go back and change the Anga translation, then this box will become unchecked. It says, oh, you changed your translation, now you need to update the back translation too. That's really helpful. All right, so that's a little bit about back translation and the interlinearizer. I would highly recommend using the interlinearizer because you'll catch all sorts of errors, especially spelling errors, uh, when you use that. I know this is very technical information. Not quite as fun as what we did this morning, but it's important. So I'm going to keep moving on. As you're preparing for the consultant check, here's things that you need to do. You need to do the back translation, or somebody on your team needs to do it. You need to get a list of key terms, uh, which hopefully you're doing as you go along. As you translate each verse, you're plugging in those key terms. Do it from the beginning, it'll save you a lot of time and headache later. You need to do a short grammar sketch of the language you're working with, so the consultant knows what kind of language it is, um, what language family it's in, you know, how, you know, anything that's peculiar about the language, how it works. It's good to have an introduction to the project, the history, uh, you know, how did the project get started, 
who's involved, what churches are involved. Um, your translation methodology, is it more literal? Is it balanced? Is it more free? It's important for the consultant to know that. Your goals, are you just doing a few portions? Are you doing oral Bible storying? Are you doing a whole New Testament? What are your goals? Those are things that you need to let the consultant know about. Okay, and then as you're trying to find a consultant, you need to uh, communicate with potential consultants. Good things to let them know are, your, again, your translation, translation methodology. If you're doing a more literal translation and the consultant is really strong on very free translations, it might not be a good fit. You might have a lot of clash there. Uh, most consultants are willing to work with a variety of translation methodologies, but it's good to make sure they're willing to work with your methodology. You want to be clear about your Greek source text. I mean, if you're getting consultants from SIL, you want to be sure that, to be clear up front, that you're using a Byzantine Greek uh, text um, rather than the critical text. Um, we'll talk about that at the end. So, uh, you'll want to know if the consultant has knowledge of the language family that you work in. In Papua New Guinea, there's two language families. There's Papuan, uh, which I call hard languages, and Austronesian, which I call easy languages. And so if a consultant's only worked in Austronesian, they might struggle a little bit with the Papuan. So see what language fam families they're familiar with. You want to talk about time, time frame for preparation and checking. How much time do they need to prepare? Uh, uh, and how long is it going to take to do the checking? You want to talk about travel and expenses. If your consultant's going to have to travel to your location, uh, who's going to pay for that? Are you paying for it? Are they paying for it? Um, get that clear up front and any, any other expectations that you might have. So these are all good things to consider when finding a consultant. Once you've got your consultant picked out, you start phase one of your consultant check, which is what I call the remote check. So this is preliminary work that you're doing in paratext, primarily through notes. So before you ever meet with a consultant in person, uh, you're sending no it, this consultant's reviewing your back translation. They're making notes on it, like I made, saying, uh, you know, you said uh, our Father in heaven, but it actually is heavens, plural. In your language group, do they refer to heaven as singular or do they refer to heavens as plural? Are you following the Greek or are you following English translations too closely when really you should have it be plural? How does your, you know, they'll ask you questions like that. Um, you know, hallowed be thy name. Is, you know, the term that you've chosen for hallowed, does that really communicate uh, in the language group? How do they understand that? You know, they're going to ask questions like that. So as much as you can do as possible remotely before the check, you'll save a lot of time later on. It reduces the time of the face-to-face -face check. And the big thing is it avoids involving mother tongue speakers in technical questions. You know, when you do a consultant check, you're bringing in two or three mother tongue speakers who've not been involved in the translation, have no knowledge of Greek, uh, may not have a, a whole lot of Bible knowledge. So you don't want to get into technical discussions about whether heaven is plural or singular in the Greek. And uh, You want to get all that out of the way ahead of time so you can focus on things that they can help you with. Okay, as you're doing a consultant check, uh, as you're responding to notes from the consultant, try not to be defensive or argumentative. This is a struggle for me, I'll be honest. I, I have notes and I just want to, you know, get into an argument. I have to really humble myself and say, okay, no, no, you're not here to do that. Just listen to what the consultant says and try to learn from it. Uh, make efforts to understand the consultant before responding. This is just a good life practice, right? When somebody's speaking to you, try to understand what they're saying before you defend yourself and tell them why they're wrong. They might actually have a good idea that you could implement. I'm preaching to myself here more than you, so don't feel uh, that I'm accusing you. Thank the consultant for good suggestions. The consultant is sacrificing their time to spend to help make your language uh, translation much better. So thank them for their work. Thank them for their good suggestions. And inform the consultant if you do not understand his or her question. Um, you may get a lot of questions that you, you just don't understand what they're asking. That happens all the time. So just go ahead and ask. Uh, I know we're running a little late here, um, but uh, just keep going. Phase two is the face-to-face -face check. So as much as possible, you've resolved all these questions that you can ahead of time. Now you're ready to do a face-to-face -face check where you have the consultant there and you have two or three representatives from the language uh, that you're translating into. They're there as well. So recruiting mother tongue speakers. 
You want to have two or three. Generally, two is good, but you can have three if you want. You don't want to have just one because here's what can happen. Sometimes somebody comes to a consultant check, a, a mother tongue speaker, and you find out that they, one, are not comfortable interacting with foreigners, or two, they don't know how to answer questions. It's just a skill some people don't have. And so if you only have one person there and you find out they can't answer questions, you're in trouble. You've just wasted a whole lot of time. So you want to recruit mother tongue speakers, you want to have at least two. It wouldn't be bad to have three. Now these are people that have not been involved in the translation work, um, but they're representatives of the language community. So you can't have any of your translators as part of the face-to-face uh, -face check. You want to try to get mother tongue speakers from a variety of denominations, tribes, villages, and backgrounds. You want to try to represent the language community as a whole um, from those various different demographics. You want them to be relatively fluent in the back translation language. If they don't understand the back translation language, it's going to slow things down considerably. Uh, it really speeds things along if they're fluent in, in the back translation language. So for example, if you're working in South America, uh, you're going to want somebody at the, at the consultant check, a uh, mother tongue speaker who also knows Spanish pretty well. If they don't know Spanish well, it's going to be very slow. Again, you want somebody who's comfortable speaking with foreigners and answering questions. Don't underestimate the importance of that. I once had somebody come to a consultant check and thankfully there were two people there because the one guy, we kept asking him questions. He literally couldn't respond. He just sat there and just, hmm, and just thought until, until somebody else, until the other guy jumped in. So we just stopped asking him questions. You want somebody who's above average intelligence, that helps. Uh, this is hard work. It's hard to listen to a translate, it's hard to answer questions about a translation. Um, and somebody with above average intelligence will do a better job of it. Uh, if possible, you want them to be good readers, somebody who can read in their own language. That, you may not find that. Avoid having any of the mother tongue translators in the sessions. So the people that have worked in the translation, don't bring them into the session. Because here's what will happen, well, at least it happens in our culture, is the consultant asks a question, the mother tongue uh, speakers are struggling to respond, and the translator starts feeding them the answers. Because they don't want them, they feel bad, they don't want, to, they don't want them to look bad uh, because they don't know the answers, so they feed them the answers. But that defeats the whole purpose of the checking session. And encourage and reassure the mother tongue speakers throughout the process. You want to make sure that they feel good about what's happening. Um, you want to encourage them. Uh, we'll get into more of that in a second. Uh, set expectations for the mother tongue speakers. Uh, begin, we usually begin a consultant checking session with relationship building. And this is generally important. Uh, it's important everywhere, but especially in other parts of the world where they're very relationship focused. You know, you want to tell your story, who you are, give them a chance to tell their story, spend some time just building relationship before you dive into the session. That'll make them more comfortable uh, with answering questions. It's just a good practice in general. Uh, you want to make sure that they understand that you're testing the translation and not them. They can feel intimidated to say, if you don't know the answer to the question, it's the, it's the fault of the translation, it's not your fault. So just say you don't know, it's okay. You really have to hammer that in. Uh, your consultant should go over all these things, but um, it's good for you to know it as well. Tell them it's okay to say, I don't know. In a lot of cultures, it's shameful to not know the answer. So you have to really make it clear it's okay if you don't know the answer. And ask them to tell you if something is awkward or not right. If they're listening to the translation, say, oh, that doesn't sound right, they may not feel free to share that unless you give them the express permission to do so. We've caught, uh, caught many things by that. Uh, try to gauge the ability of the mother tongue speakers to interact with the text. Uh, what I mean by that, some people can listen to a whole passage and then they can recite back in the uh, trade language what happened in that passage. For other people, they're going to need to hear it verse by verse. And you're going to have to move more slowly or in smaller segments. So try to gauge that as you go. Uh, for the face-to-face -face check, uh, you as the facilitator or advisor, try to think like a consultant. Uh, you are not there to pass the consultant check, you are there to improve your translation. So don't try to get things 
past that maybe aren't good, try to say, yeah, maybe this is a problem in our translation. We need to address it. Try to help the consultant find potential errors and problems. Your consultant won't ch catch everything, but you might. You might be in this session and be like, oh, I don't, I don't think they're understanding that right. Can I jump in and ask them a question? Again, ev evaluate speed of reading or response. Um, you may ask people, are you understanding this? Oh, yeah, we understand it. But they're just telling you what they, what they think you want to hear. So if they're really struggling with reading or they're struggling with responding, you can sort of gauge that and say, okay, I think they're really, they're not quite getting this. You, know, you really have to read body language because uh, you might not get verbal answers. You know, evaluate body language and nonverbal cues. Again, avoid arguing with the consultants. If the consultant is suggesting things you're not comfortable with, you can say things like, uh, I'll discuss that with the translation team and get back to you. Is that okay? Or, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, you don't want to get involved in debates with your consultant in front of mother tongue speakers. So just put those to the side. These can be intense times because we're talking about core theological issues. And especially if you're working with consultants from, who are not from a conservative Anabaptist background, you may, you may hit some of these hard points and it's best to just lay them aside during the session and come back to them later. Okay, other points to consider. Uh, you generally don't want to do more than three weeks of face-to-face -face consultant checking. It's tiring work. Everybody will get tired. Um, and so keep it less than three weeks as a general rule. Are you going to compensate the mother tongue speakers for their time to be involved in the consultant check? Are you going to compensate them for their transportation? It's good things to keep in mind. That's going to vary by context. Uh, I usually give them a little gift to thank them for their time. I pay for their transportation, uh, but that'll be up to you. The consultant does not have the final say, uh, at least in SIL, how SIL works. The consultant check is something that you're required to do, but they don't have the final say. So you can listen to what they have to say and implement their suggestions, but ultimately you are not uh, accountable to them. Uh, check as you go, meaning as you finish a book, try to check that book. Try not to, you know, finish 75% of the New Testament and then start checking. That's not good. It's better to do it as you go. And a lot of, like, SIL won't let you check more than 20% of your books in a year. So uh, try to do it as you go along. Yeah, checking limits per calendar year, I mentioned that. All right, I know we're running low on time, but I'll give you two stories of how consultant checks have helped. Mark 131 in Anga. This is our first consultant check. Here's the Anga back translation. And when they had told him, Jesus went to where the woman was lying. Again, this is Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus went to where the woman was lying and then held her by her hand and then raised her up. Then, when the body heat that was happening had become nothing, fever, Ba took and gave them food, saying, eat. Ba. See, in Enga, there's, one, there's a third singular personal pronoun, one. In English, we have three, he, she, it. In Enga, there's just one, and it can mean any of those. So it says, Ba took and gave them food, saying, eat. And so we asked the mother tongue speaker, okay, who got up and gave them food and told them to eat? Well, Jesus did. Because Ba could refer to he or she. And so he figured, oh, it must have been Jesus that did that. And so that's, that's something where, you know, when the translation team and I read it, we obviously knew that it was Simon Peter's mother-in-law that did it. And we never even thought that somebody would understand it otherwise. But in the consultant check, we figured out, oh, he's misunderstanding who's doing this. And so we made it a little more specific. Instead of saying ba, we said the woman or that woman. And so that helped improve our translation. All right, another example. Matthew 18, 2 to 3. When they said that, Jesus told a small child to come and then stood the child in their midst, saying to them, if you do not change your behavior and become like a small child, you will not enter into the ruling domain that is on top of the sky. I say that to you truly. You, you understand that verse? You, you understand, uh, in, I mean, it's familiar to you? Unless you become like little children, you shall by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we said... What are the co consultant asked, what are little children like? 
Now, what would you expect their answer to be? What would you expect their answer? What, if somebody read you that passage in English, unless you become like a child, you shall by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. What would you say children are like? What are the qualities of children that Jesus is emphasizing? Forgive quickly. Forgive quickly. Yeah. Dependent. Dependent. Yeah. Sincere. Yes, teachable, sincere. Yeah. So we're expecting those sorts of answers. So we said, okay, what are, what are children like? They said, oh, man, they are so stubborn. They never do what you tell them to do. Uh, they are just terrible. And we're thinking, what in the world is going on? Why are... Why are they saying these things? Why are they emphasizing all the negative qualities of children? So we took a closer look at the translation and we realized that the words do not, it's just a small uh, prefix on a word, N-A, that prefix was missing. So what it actually said is, if you change your behavior and become like a small child, you will not enter into the ruling domain <laughs> that is on top of the sky. So, you know, they all want to get into the kingdom of God. And so they're saying, well, we don't want to be like little children who are so stubborn. We're going to, you know, not be like them so that we can enter into the kingdom of God. <laughs> and so, again, that was something that slipped through the cracks all this time, and it was only in the consultant check where we realized, okay, we're, we're missing a key point here. And so we were able to add that back in. And, they, and then they were st started giving the answers we would expect. All right. So anyway, I know that's a lot of technical information. It's hard to make it uh, kind of light and fun, but... Uh, it's, and it's a lot. I covered a lot. It's, if you just sort of remember some of it, I hope that'll be helpful. Uh, we could probably spend all afternoon talking about this, but we'll bring it to a close there.